Okay, then we'll talk a little bit of shop. Uh, we uh, orchestra rehearses Sunday afternoons, but we also rehearse here early in, in the morning. And uh, after rehearsal this morning, I was getting my little articles together. Rhonda's my standmate. <laughs> Told her secret, um, but uh, you know I was getting them, and we were just kind of joking about getting the news in order. No, you can't create order out of disorder. You, know, you just can't. So it won't matter what order we do these in. Uh, we'll we'll talk about those. We'll get into Timothy, and we're going to do some really really neat stuff. I mean, like really really neat stuff. Of, uh, next week or two, uh, there are a couple of areas uh, that we want to to emphasize. And it's all biblical and it's all uh, scriptural. So let's look at some of these articles and then we'll, we'll talk some shopping. Get back into them in Timothy. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, here's a, an interesting one. Uh, education chief grilled about evolution uh, stance. And Barbara Cargill, uh, what she was only asking for in the Senate, Senate uh, nominations committee was that both sides of the evolution story be told. That you know, whatever uh, facts are there that dispute, that unequivocally dispute the theory of evolution, that those at least be presented uh, to the student. And what has never been answered to me by anybody is how you can have a theory that violates known laws. Uh, that's, that's just beyond me. But anyway, there are folks who still adhere to that. And uh, Senator Kirk Watson, uh, he's the senator from Austin, he had questioned Cargill extensively, particularly about her concerns that all sides of the debate over human evolution be covered in textbooks and other learning materials. Well, what is the concern that Senator Watson has? He doesn't want all sides taught, because when all sides are taught, the theory fails. It has to, because you not go against a known law. Well, so here's the quote. Well, you said you wanted science books to teach another side to evolution. He said, referring to recent Cargill comments, evolution is, in fact, established science. Are you now advocating another side to evolution? I said, well, you know what? If it's established fact, then let the other side be told, and we'll see if it's established fact or not. Interesting. I, I went to school with Kurt Watson. You know, we were in the same debate classes. He's a excellent debater. He's a, he's a top tier uh, debater. Uh, but you know, it is it is the fool who says there is no God. You know, whatever, Kirk. Whatever. <laughs> um, let's see. Same sex partners still can't get medical benefits. And uh, you know, I didn't bring any Tim Tebow articles that I figured you wouldn't be interested. <laughs> I figured, well, what he won't say, I will. Uh, but, you know, with, with regard to the stance that the church has taken, and in particular First Baptist Church, I, I listen to that uh, broadcast. I listen to every single broadcast that comes out of there, and I've never seen Eric come out of the church uh, because it, it stands on, on the Word of God. And the issue with, with same-sex partners and homosexuality, it's, it's not a new morality. There is no such thing as new morality or modern morality. It's the same old immorality. And the reason we just take look, note of it right now is because Jesus said, hey, this is one of the end time sins, as in the days of Noah. And it is an end time <coughs> sin. And if you don't think it's an end time sin, ask the folks in Sodom and Gomorrah what happened to them. That's well, an end time stuff. All right, well. Carry on with that. Uh, let's see, the Pope's resignation sets up battle over church's court. Here's what's very, very interesting uh, about what's going on over there at the Vatican is that, you know, this doesn't happen too often. I think the last time that a Pope was resigned was like 600 years ago. So it's pretty taboo. And the problem is this if the church itself, if the Catholic Church, has decreed that the Pope is infallible, well, what happens when you have two popes? And what happens if one issues a papal encyclical that contradicts the other pope who's still alive? You have a hundred year war. The hundred year war. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 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 
somebody else. You know, one pope was in France, the other one was in Rome. So yeah. Yeah. No, no, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, you're right. Okay, and and there is, and it brings really the the whole strength of the Reformation movement was what Martin Luther said. Sola Scriptura. I was only the Scripture, only the sacred Scripture. That's your final authority. And then you get away from these, uh, you know, these these side issues that these distract you from the Word of God. It, it is the Word of God. It, it's only Scripture. So we'll see how that plays out. And then uh, speaking of prophecies, you know, Jesus had talked about in the end days it'd be an increase in her earthquakes and storms and wind and drought. Well, interesting. Uh, the U.S. has been walloped by twice as many of the most extreme snowstorms in the past 50 years as in the previous 60, according to a new study. All right, you know, the Lord said to look for all these, look for these things. And what a great time to be alive because, you know, we really don't have to even look for them. They just show up. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to look at all. They're not hidden. They're hidden at all. And what did he say? The, the hope is this. When you see these things, look up your redemption door. So you don't focus on these things of saying, okay, I'm just checking that off. All right, I see that, I see that, I see that. So what's he saying? Be ready. Like the versions with the oil and the lamp. You've got to be ready. Okay, and with regard to, uh, to shop, everybody wants to be a New Testament church. We want to be a New Testament church. Okay, very good. Well, which one? Yeah. Which New Testament church do you want to be? I can think of some New Testament churches that I would not want to be. You know, what I really want to see is, let's, let's be the church. You know, especially at our age, we're too old to play church. You know, don't you want the real deal? You know, don't you want the real deal? And part of what we did this morning in praying over Tina, that's the real deal. Okay? That's the real deal. And James is very, very clear. Uh, James is clear about what to do. Is any, um, any among you sick? Let him ask the elders. And they lay hands and want the Lord. And that's something that, that we we don't have that ministry on this campus. We don't have it. And we're in error. And so we walk around sick, and when Jesus has given us this you know, this directive, this, this remedy, and I'll confess to you, you know, I, I do some rough and tumble stuff sometimes. You know, and if I fall off the mountain or if I, you know, crash my bike, you know, I go over to, to Hong Park Perez over here. And they have a healing service. That's the first thing you do. I head right over there. The elders come. They pray over me. They anoint me with the oil. I don't, I don't have time for pain and all that stuff. I don't have time for it. So why do I have to go to the Presbyterians to do that? You know, that's embarrassing to me. But that's where I go. Well, wouldn't it be cool to have a place here? You know, if nothing else, just in this class. So, you know, if you're sick, you want to pray, let's just do it here. Let's just do it here. And, and that's something that, as a church, we need to look at in the future. And having said that, you know, most of y'all, I've, I've submitted a lot of your names to be on committees. Lucky! We know! We know! I have, I have, I have, and let me, let me just say this, let me motivate you, let me motivate you to, well, let me ask Brenda, Brenda, am I on a committee? If you would please answer up, so he doesn't have to be so many committees, I would appreciate seeing well, Let me say that. Okay, yes, he is on a committee. <laughs> yeah. when, when you get the call, whether it's for me or somebody else, and you say, well, you know what, I'm too busy, or I don't have time, or that's a bad night, or whatever, you know, fine. But know that I'm going to be tempted to fill that slot. And I'm going to do what I think is right. And you might not like it. <laughs> So if for no other reason, you should volunteer to be on the committee to keep me off. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm, I'm telling, I'm warning you. And you're going to come in, you're going to come in someday, and you're going to look at the sanctuary and say, who changed this place up? Church isn't run by the deacon. Church isn't run by Miller or Ronnie. Church is run by us. We run the church with committees. That's just how it's done on this campus. And when you don't serve in the committee, then I'm on there, and I've got some opinions. <laughs> He's telling you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> after yesterday's rehearsal, I'm ready for you to put me on the education committee, okay? Education. Education. 
<laughs> Who else has a committee? We're ready now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What does that have to do with the rehearsal? Uh, it just had a lot to do with the conversation. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's how decisions are made on this campus. All right, so what you need to be qualified, faithful giving, faithful attendance. And then you're on the, on the, on the list. And you'll, you'll, get the call. you'll get the call. Okay, here we go. Let's go to Timothy. And, you know, I told you last week that we were through with the first verse. Well, that wasn't entirely so, because I, wouldn't, I was afraid you might not come back. So, but this is so pregnant with me. It's so pregnant with, with you. And as we know, this is the last epistle, the pastoral epistle, that Paul is writing to Timothy right before he gets put to the sword. And we're going to go through this, and, and, and we're going to kind of scan just a little bit down the, the first chapter again. And then we're going to stop on some truths. And are we okay with where we've come so far? We know it's, we're justified, we're justified by grace. It's grace plus faith plus nothing else. And we, we went through the arguments, the philosophical <coughs> arguments about God and the sovereignty. And that all Christians can agree that God is sovereign and man is fallen. And so the questions are, well, what's the interrelationship between the, the two? And... We'll go through this, and then we're going to answer the question, and I'm going to answer the question of why, why we're here. I mean, like, why are you here, like, right now, right now, in this room, on this campus? And we're going to take a look, and we'll, we'll answer all those questions. So, uh, we've gone through chapter one, we're going to call through it again, and we're going to part at, at verses eight and nine, and, and work through those, and we're going to pull out these truths, and I think this is going to really bless us. I, I really think it is. So, let's go to verse three. We talked last week about grace, mercy, and peace, and how in every other epistle, Paul begins his general declaration, his introduction into the letter, with the words grace and peace. And that's true of all those epistles, the <coughs> earlier general epistles, the prison epistles. And then when you get to the pastoral epistles, he inserts the word mercy. And we've looked at all the philosophical arguments about what's fair and what's not fair, and why is it that God supernaturally chooses to intervene in the lives of some and not others? Well, that's because to some he shows mercy, and the opportunity is given to all. Everybody, for God so loved the world, everybody has the opportunity to hear the gospel in some manner or another. You have the creation as evidences, and he has spoken into the heart of man. Man knows, in his heart, he knows that there is a God. Well, he supernaturally chooses mercy to some. And why is that important? Alright, let's walk through and we'll look at verse 3. And, and Paul says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers day and night. I have a man of prayer, praying day and night, and understanding the history of the forefathers who faithfully and accurately trans the gospel from generation to generation. Now he's the recipient. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I might be filled with joy. And at this stage, Paul is not under house arrest. He is actually in the prison, and there's an 18-inch hole in the ceiling that he's able to hand these letters out to Timothy. And five, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So he's going back to this lineage, this holy lineage from Lois and Eunice that they passed it on to Timothy. All right, we're at that stage now. What's our responsibility? We've had given it to our children. Our responsibility to our grandchildren is what? That's unfeigned faith that we plant that seed so it takes root in them. And here we have the exhortation. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. This is what we're going to come back to. Stir up the gift of God. It's sort of like Jack the Lane. We've got these gifts, you know, and, and what we need, it's what do you say? Use it or lose it? Stir up the gifts. What gifts? All the gifts. Paul said, earnestly desire all the gifts. And in relation to what I'd like to see us do in our campus. I know in a campus this large, with this many believers, most certainly we have those that have the gifts of healing and they're not being exercised. Uh, when Pastor Dennison, he wrote out that little chart for us so that we could kind of take the little test and have direction on our spiritual gifts. 
over, he did that what, over a two year period and went out of town and turned it up. Well, what went out of town? Well, you know, we don't need the gifts or I don't care about the gifts. We're not interested in the gifts or we hey, Baptists don't have gifts. Or whatever it was. Or whatever it was. But what's he saying? This is it. Church, stir them up. Stir up the gifts. You know, when you're, you got a, you got a pot of soup, a pot of chili, you, you stir it up and it, 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 it rises, it? it comes to the top. <coughs> bring them, bring them. Let that be your inclination. Because we need this gift, these gifts for service. Okay, we're coming back to that. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, power, love, sound mind. But not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Here we go. Who has, number one, saved us. Right? He saved us. And then what? And called us with a, what kind of calling? A holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. He saved us, given us a holy calling in order to achieve his eternal purposes. And that promise, that decision was made before the world began. Well, I can go home and I can look at my birth certificate. And my birth certificate says I was born in the 50s. I'm pretty sure the world began before me. I'm pretty sure about that. But how can I then be a recipient of the promises? How? How is it? Who was this promise made to? And look at verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. All right. We're going to part there, and let's look at some verses. Let's, go, let's do some history. We're going to go to Psalm 105. We're going to go to Psalm 105. And this is going to take us a couple of weeks, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. We're going to have a lot of fun with this. So Psalm 105. And let's get this history lesson out of 105. And what we want to look at as we're going through Psalm 105, how many times the word he, and how many times the word his is present. And we'll see this truth played out in the Old Testament just as confirmation. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice to seek the Lord. Do you want to have a joyful heart? Uh, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. <clears throat> Remember his marvelous works that he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham... His servant, ye children of Jacob, is chosen. Seed of Abraham, servant, Jacob, chosen. Are, are we the seed of Abraham? Bet we are. I mean, we sing that song, right? Uh, Many sons have father Abraham. <laughs> So that's all that's all <laughs> because that's an absolute truth. If we're the seed of Father Abraham, and you are, and Paul made this very clear, and so did Moses. Moses said the same thing. He said, one day, one day there will be a people, a remnant that God's going to call out, and they're not going to be circumcised of skin. They're going to be circumcised of heart. They're going to be circumcised of heart. Meaning what? You still get saved the old-fashioned way, but faith. Abraham came by faith. There wasn't the law in Abraham's time. There weren't Jews in Abraham's time. It was Abraham by faith. Why did God choose Abraham? Because he did. There was nothing inherently meritorious about Abraham. <coughs> Just like there is nothing inherently desirable in any of us that God should claim us for his own. He chose him because he chose him, and that's God's sovereign choice. All right, he chose Abraham. Let's go on. 
7. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. That's, that's pretty inclusive. All the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations is his covenant. Well, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee, Will I give thee the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when ye were but a few men in number, yea, very few and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. He chose Abraham, he chose Jacob for Israel, and he made that same covenant to Israel. Why did God choose Israel? Because he wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> because he did. And we say, look, of all the people you could have chosen, they were small in number. They weren't in the land. Hey, they were slaves right before they went into land. He chose them because he chose them. That's his sovereign purpose. That's his sovereign right. And you know what? He could choose you if he wants to. And if you're sitting here, he did. He did. He gets to choose. He is sovereign. What's the little poem? Um, How odd of God to choose the Jews. Very short poem. <laughs> but you would have had the same dilemma had you chosen anybody else. If you'd chosen the Hittites or anybody else, he chose them because he chose them. I don't see why. We're all figuring this out now. 16. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land, and he broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for service. See the eternal purposes of God. He called the famine to raise up Joseph to send him to Egypt, whose feet they hurt with fetters, and he was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him, and the king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. But he made lord of his house and ruler of all his substance to bind his princes in their pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. And then Israel came also into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of him. So he's setting all this history up to accomplish his uninfluenced, his purposes are not influenced by any outside source. There's no lobby, no political action committee that's influencing the work or will of God. And we can look at this and say, well, you know, God, that's not fair that you chose them. Or, or that's not good and that's not right. Remember the problem of the judges? What was the problem of the judges? <clears throat> People were doing what was right in their own side. And you, we take our feeble, fallen, carnal mind, and we challenge God, is a thing good? What makes a thing good and right? Good and right. Is it because we think it's good and right? Or is it because God has ordained that this is what is good and this is what is right? That's what makes us a theocentric theocentric lifestyle as opposed to an anthrocentric lifestyle which believes what is good and right is whatever man thinks it is. A theocentric lifestyle is it's good and right because God decrees it, he wills it, and brings it to pass. Alright, All right. 23. Israel came also into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. Even though they were so small. He turned their heart to hate his people to deal subtly with his servants, and he sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. Why did he choose Moses? Because he wanted to. Because he wanted to. <laughs> but Moses stuttered. That's none of our business. He chose Moses because he wanted Moses. And he showed him this bush. All right. And they showed him signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. And he sent darkness and made it dark. And they rebelled not against his And he turned their waters to blood and slew their fish. 
their land brought forth frogs in abundance and chambers to the kings. And he spake, and there came divers sorts of flies and lice in their coasts, and he gave them hail for rain and flame and fire in their land. And he smote their vines also and their fig trees and brake the trees off the coast. And he spake, and the locusts came and the caterpillars and without number, and they did eat up all the herbs of the land and devoured the fruit of the ground. And he smote also all the firstborn in their land chief of all their strength. And what's fascinating about the ten about the plagues is that each plague was directed at an Egyptian god. The, the Egyptians had a god for every single one of these elements. And Yahweh shows up and says, you're a god of death. I can play with your god when I want to because they're not god. So he's speaking to the Egyptians as much as he's speaking to the Jews and showing forth his power. 37, and he brought them forth with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. You know what? They came walking out of there as supernatural help. And Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them fell upon them, and spread a cloud for covering, and fire to give light in the night. And the people asked, and he brought quails, and satisfied them with bread of heaven. And he opened the rock, and the waters gushed out, and they ran in dry places like river, for he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness. His chosen. How many times has that been emphasized? He chooses. 44. And gave them the lands of the heathen. Okay. And they inherited the labor of the people that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Alright. In game, in purpose. Why did he raise up a people? Why did he choose Abraham? Why did he choose Joseph? Why did he choose Moses? To raise up a people who would observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise ye the Lord. But notice why, when he sent them to Canaan, when he sent them to Canaan, why not, and God could have done this, why not send them to a place that wasn't already populated? Hey, you know, he could have cleared them out by some other way. Why send them to a place that was already possessed by heathen? Okay, we're going to look at that. All right. And musicians, I didn't have to go. We started early this week, so we'll, we'll finish a little early this week. Let's look at the threefold ministry. And Paul started us out with grace and mercy and peace. And we just saw in verses 8 and 9 that threefold ministry. The first is what? The first part in the sal salvific purposes of God, under grace is what? It's justification. All right, we just spent a couple weeks up. <coughs> justification. You are justified by God. Every one of us at the point of salvation, we are clean. We are, he looks at us as clean. We're just right. That's how we're able to stand before God. It's justification because of grace, through faith plus nothing. And that's the fallacy of every other world religion, that somehow you can do it on your own. But then what? But then we have this mercy. And what's the second? After justification, Paul says the next step, the golden chain that Paul laid out. What's the next step? It's a big one. Next step? Sanctification. Okay? Justification. You're justified by faith and grace. Why? Why? So you can walk in the ways of God. Why? Why? So you can be a light to the world. And then what's the third tenet of the salvific promises? They're what? Glorification. All right? It's a three-step process, and that's the golden chain that Paul lays out in several books. These, <coughs> this is the eternal purpose of God. And next week we're going to look at the promises. Well, what happens? Justification, it does what? Uh, under, under the umbrella of sin. Justification does what? It saves us from the penalty of sin. It saves us from the penalty. And then we walk in His ways and we're washed by the water of the Word. Sanctification does what? It, it, it releases us from what? The power of sin. You will never be able to be free from the power of sin in your life unless you walk in sanctification and cleanse by the water, but it's about renewing the mind. Renewing the mind. And then the last final step is what? Glorification. 
where we're saved not just from the penalty, not just from the power, we're saved from the very presence of sin. And this is where we're going. That's the, direct, that's the directive. And from the beginning of the foundation of the world, God has called forth a holy people who he can share his glory with. And this is the road. This is the road that the Hebrews were on. This was the road that Abraham... And you go, that's how you go from faith to faith to faith. And that's where we're going. We're going to a world order where we are freed from the presence of sin. So what are our responsibilities now? One, to be justified before God. Be freed from the power of sin. So we have, we have the ability to live that life, walking in his ways, because at some point, we're going to be free from the whole mess. All right. Okay, we'll continue next week, and we're going to lift these promises. It's going to be fun. Well, I'm going to have fun anyway. Uh, it is going to be fun. And it's going to be freeing, and, and, and we're going to have a, just a, a lot of freedom. A lot of freedom to come. Okay. And I know musicians, we're, we, we have to go.